In these first three days, we've covered a lot of ground. We've uh, talked about the um, causal laws of human action with, with respect to the uh, physical laws that uh, exist in the relationships between different means in the capital structure and, uh, and those means and the ends that we're uh, uh, striving to attain in action or the structure of production. We talked about the laws of uh, valuation of means and ends, how uh, we impute value and uh, what the laws of uh, utility imply. Uh, we've talked about appraisement and economic calculation so uh, that the uh, efficient decisions can be made in the division of labor about production. <clears throat> and uh, in this uh, talk, we want to uh, discuss uh, the laws of the valuation of time. And then, uh, uh, related to that, of course, the uh, principles or laws of appraisement, that is economic calculation, pricing, uh, with respect to uh, a time. Now, the first point to make, this is a crucial point uh, often overlooked in this discussion. Uh, it was emphasized uh, most dramatically by Frank Federer, who was one of the pioneers in the pure uh, time preference theory of interest, is that when we think about valuation with respect to time, there are two different aspects of valuation with respect to time. One of them we'll call the timing of an action. <clears throat> And the other is time preference. And while these two are um, always uh, going on when we're uh, thinking about our action with respect to time, they're certainly conceptually distinct. And it's important for us to see the distinction and then the lines of logic that follow from that uh, distinction. So uh, with respect to timing, what we'll uh, point out is that when we think about the timing of an action, what results from this with respect to appraisement is what we might call temporal prices. And we'll, we'll speak about this first. And then with respect to time preference, what we get, of course, are intertemporal prices, right? the uh, rate of interest. Okay, so let's start with the temporal aspects uh, of action. This again refers to how do we choose uh, the timing of an action, G given that we're uh, you know, considering some particular action to take, uh, how do we decide uh, when in the stream of time to uh, undertake the action? Uh, we know, as Mises uh, famously put it, that time is an irreversible flux. Right? We, uh, time just marches on, right? And uh, we can't uh, allocate time as we allocate other means. We can't just store it up, right, and uh, apply it to a particular end whenever we want, like we save up money and then we... Uh, buy a new car or something of the sort. Uh, so when we um, uh, think about uh, allocating in an economizing way with respect to time, um, since we can't gather up time and allocate it at any particular moment, what we can do is place our action in the stream of time, so to speak. Uh, now, this is uh, relevant any time an action, any time we assess in our mind, we make a judgment in our mind, that an action might in fact have a different value depending upon when we take it. So a simple illustration of this is my, uh, uh, my wife and I have a wedding anniversary on August 17th. And if we celebrate our wedding anniversary on August 17th, it has more value than if we celebrate it on you know, December 1st. It, it matters to some degree, you know, how close to August 17th it is that we, uh, uh, we, we celebrate. It, it, so it's the same action, it's the same, you know, activity that we would engage in in any case, but uh, the timing matters. And therefore, it seems you know, sort of obvious, right, that uh, we always have a tendency to uh, place our actions in time where the value is the greatest. We could say, we could say something like this, right, the, marginal utility of any particular good can vary depending upon the moment we use it. Not only does it vary from one action to another, you know, we take water and we drink it or we water plants or whatever, but it matters when we drink the water. Do we, do we drink it at nine in the morning or 10 in the morning or do we drink it tomorrow or the next day and so on, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, to economize our actions with respect to the timing of the action, we would we would uh, you know, attempt to 
uh, place our action in time where the marginal utility is the greatest, right? Where we get the greatest value. This is the idea. Now, with respect to appraisement, of course, what this leads to, when we begin to in engage in exchange on the basis of, of these different values that we perceive accruing to the same good or the same action at different moments in time, what we get are what are called uh, forward prices. These emerge in futures markets. Right? So what happens is today, two parties who disagree, perhaps, because they're speculating about the value, the future value, the value on December 1st of some particular good, let's say oil, can make a, an exchange today to agree to uh, trade oil at a stipulated price in the future. That's called a forward price. And then, of course, the market will clear. Right? We'll, have, we'll have speculators on both sides of the issue. They think that the uh, December 1st price of oil will be higher than the spot price today, and then the other speculators think it'll be lower. And the market will clear. The quantity demand and quantity supplied of these speculators is, is the same. And of course, this forward price could be either higher than the spot price, or it could be the same as the spot price, or lower, right? There isn't anything, there's no law of economics that would say that uh, futures price in the futures market, the price of oil to be delivered on December 1st, must be higher than the spot price today. I mean, I, I know there's some economists that argue that it does, but I mean, you just look at the evidence, right? It, it uh, doesn't seem to comport with their claim. Uh, sometimes future prices or forward prices are lower than spot prices, sometimes equal. So, so this is one dimension of valuing. And uh, quite apparently, the same sort of um, uh, economizing result comes from having appraisement of these forward prices as it does spot prices. So if the forward price of um, oil to be delivered again on December 1st is $150, then entrepreneurs will begin to um, reallocate resources to bring a greater supply of oil uh, to the market on December 1st than, than currently, right? They'll ramp up production or, or they'll store existing oil or however to reallocate it to its higher, uh, higher valued uh, moment in time. Okay, now let's turn to the intertemporal uh, aspects of action. <clears throat> and here is uh, where we get to the uh, interest rate and, and uh, time preference. So let's begin with time preference. We, uh, all economic reasoning, remember, begins with our uh, subjective values. Time preference we uh, define this way. Time preference is the satisfaction of an end sooner is preferred to the same satisfaction attained later. So for a given satisfaction that we could attain, we prefer to attain it sooner as opposed to later. Now time preference, just like the concept of preference, where we say in action we always have a pre right? we value one option relative to another and we prefer one over the other and select the preferred one. A time preference, just like preference, is a re reflective fact about acting. Time preference is not something we deduce about action. Time preference is a basic feature of acting. All, in fact, all temporal beings have time preference. It's just in the nature of temporal existence that a temporal being distinguishes between sooner and later and prefers sooner. J just like because we're finite beings, we distinguish between more of a good and less of a good, and we prefer more. That, that's not a deduction, right? That's a basic principle. That's a reflective fact about acting. I, I say this because oftentimes in this debate about time preference, um, one side argues that, well, time preference can't be true because, because after all, we can come up with uh, various deductive inferences that seem to contradict it. Or we can come up with contrary examples of it, or something like this. But, but clearly this is all beside the point. This, this isn't getting to the, uh, to the uh, character of what we mean when we uh, use the uh, term, what we mean by the concept of time preference. Time preference is, is, is a fundamental praxeological notion. Okay, now, having said that, let me just make sure, again, we see the import of this. Uh, 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 it, uh, as Mises points out, uh, time preference then is not a psychological condition that, that, you know, waxes and wanes, right? 
Time preference is not the uh, disutility of waiting or you know, the discomfort of, uh, uh, of anticipation or something of the sort. Um, that again is just a, uh, you know, a particular condition of particular people when they act. Some, some people have disutility of waiting and, and some people don't. Some people have it to a greater degree, some people don't. This isn't what, we're, what we mean by time preference. Right? Time preference is, is not the psychological disposition of a person, or it doesn't come from the psychological disposition of a person. Uh, Mises points out that it's also not physiological. Time preference doesn't exist because we have physiological needs that have to be met or we die. That, that isn't <laughs> what we mean by time. Time preference does arise because of that. Uh, as he points out, we have time preference even for those needs, right? And, and so this uh, doesn't, uh, well, this is just a different aspect of acting to say that we have physiological needs. <clears throat> now, uh, because time preference is a basic feature of acting, as Mises points out, it's ubiquitous in all actions. It doesn't matter what the circumstances of our action are. It doesn't matter how old we are, young we are, rich we are, poor we are. It doesn't matter if, if we're Robbins and Caruso or if we live in an advanced uh, division of labor society. Everybody always has time preference. Everybody always prefers a given satisfaction sooner to the same satisfaction later. Um, Mises goes on to point out that uh, the later in time that a satisfaction is to be attained, the heavier the discount. This must be true because if, it, because if not, then we could have infinite or indefinite time horizons. We don't in fact have indefinite time horizons, right? Again, because we're temporal beings, we tend to discount more heavily a satisfaction to be acquired in 50 years as opposed to be uh, to uh, one to be acquired in, uh, say, five days. <clears throat> okay, now let's look at some of the implications of time preference. W once, once we see that time preference is this uh, fundamental uh, principle involved in all uh, decisions of uh, acting, uh, what does it imply? Well, of course, one thing that it implies quite uh, obviously is that longer processes of production must generate more valuable goods. Otherwise, we would not choose them, right? Or to put the point uh, the other way around, given that we have a shorter production process that generates the same value of output as a longer one, we'll choose the shorter one. Notice this means that in every situation of acting, a person, you know, setting aside errors that a person makes, entrepreneurial errors, a person has already adopted all of, or in society, we've already adopted all of the shortest, most productive production processes. This only leaves longer, more productive production processes for us to adopt. This is, why do we do this? Because of time preference. <clears throat> uh, if we didn't have time preference, then uh, we wouldn't engage in the production of consumer goods in shorter production processes, as long as longer, more productive production processes were available. I mean, think of an example of this. If we, if we really didn't care about sooner versus later, and we didn't care how much later, then uh, as soon as uh, you know, Adam and Eve come out of the Garden of Eden, instead of setting about uh, you know, trying to quickly grow uh, you know, food and uh, set up a little hut or uh, make animal skin clothing or whatever, they would have set on the process of uh, producing, uh, let's say, uh, rocket ships or, uh, right? or modern automobiles or uh, air conditioning or something of the sort. Well, why not, right? I mean, that's a more valuable good, certainly, to have a, you know, an office building or a, you know, one of those um, material beaming devices that they have in Star Trek. You know, maybe someday we can produce these. But why not? What, let's just set out on those now, right? Because if we don't have time preference and we don't care how much later it is in time that we're to receive the goods, this is the sort of thing that we would do. <clears throat> um, Okay, uh, now let's uh, take up this question of exceptions to time preference. Again, oftentimes people argue this way. They argue about the implications or the exceptions to time preference, uh, trying to you know, poke holes in the uh, existence of time preference. And uh, Mises, again, deals with this where he points out that it, it, there can't be any exceptions to time preference. 
any more than in human action, any more than there can be exceptions to preference. Okay? These two uh, concepts are analogous to each other. They're both fundamental praxeological facts about acting. N nobody can ever act in a way that contradicts their preference. Why? Because we define preference as that judgment of the mind by which a person chooses their course of action. See, so it's, so you can't come up with counterexamples, right, it, with exceptions. And you can't do this then for time preference either, since time preference is embedded in the nature of finite existence. You can come up with, you know, clever sounding cases, but they're not real exceptions. Uh, Mises gives a couple of these that are in the literature. Uh, one is, uh, he says, um, Suppose we have a guy and he gets uh, two uh, theater tickets for the same evening, both for Friday evening, let's say. And he says, oh, I wish that second theater ticket was for Saturday. And, and people say, oh, see, he prefers the future good, right? He, he, future good is, is worth more to him than the present good. And Mises says, well, no, 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 that's not the situation at all, right? The situation is he has two mutually exclusive options and he has to give one up. Right? So that's not even a time preference uh, uh, issue. Uh, then the other case is, uh, uh, you know, ice in the winter and ice in the summer. You read through human action, you find this, this uh, alleged exception to time preference. In the winter time, people prefer ice in the summer. Uh, and therefore, this contradicts time preference, right? They prefer the future good uh, to, the, to the present good. When time preference says we always prefer the present to the future, right, or sooner to later. Now, I don't think Mises' way of treating this issue is satisfactory, so let me just give you the, the Frank Fetter way, which I think is uh, more uh, logically sound. Um, Fetter says, well, uh, look, uh, he here, in, in, ca in this case, what we've done when we think about this problem of comparing the, uh, we have a person who's comparing the value of ice that he possesses, let's say, right now in winter to, to the ice that he may have in summer, what we're doing is we're conflating the two different valuing aspects of time. That, that's the problem. That's why this seems like an exception to time preference, right? We're conflating the timing of the action with time preference. They're both, they're both involved in this action. And the timing of the action, it, that, that value of having ice in the summer, because the timing of using ice in the summer is more valuable to us, is overwhelming time preference in this example. Of course, we, in the winter, we value ice in the summer more than we value ice in the winter, you know, right now. But that's because ice in the summer uh, has a greater value, just like having my, uh, celebrating my anniversary on August 17th has a greater value to me than on any other day of the year. This, this, this again, is no exception to time preference. Time preference just says, we set aside the timing of action and we look just at the distinction between sooner and later for the same satisfaction, then sooner is always preferred to later for the same satisfaction. So this is how, uh, praxeologically, we would deal with that alleged exception. Uh, the third case is the case of the miser. So some people say, well, look, uh, don't we have people who actually exhibit you know, sort of zero time preference? What about Scrooge, right? He just sits and never, never gets, he always wait, you know, counts his money, hoards it up, and and, you know, plays with it and so on and so forth. And he never, never spends it. He never actually engages in any, in any uh, you know, consumption. Isn't that, uh, therefore, an exception? And uh, as Mises points out, well, okay, Scrooge has low time preference, right? But he doesn't have zero time preference. He still consumes in the present. It's not like he, he values future satisfaction over present satisfaction and therefore delays all of the attempts to get satisfaction into the future. No, he still eats his gruel and uh, he sleeps in his straw bed or whatever and you know, try to, tries to minimize all of his expenses to hoard up more, uh, more uh, gold. <clears throat> okay, so uh, having dispensed with that, let's get to the uh, rate of interest and see how the, the argument runs uh, with respect to the rate, uh, uh, rate of interest from time preference. So time preference manifests itself in what Mises calls originary interest, or what we might call the pure rate of interest. This is Rothbard's uh, phrase. This is the premium on present money, when present money is exchanged for future money, or we can just as well say the discount uh, on future money. So, uh, so the claim here is that the interest rate is just a manifestation of our preference for sooner versus later. 
the manifestation is that present money, a given amount of present money, commands a premium over the same amount of future money uh, with equal purchasing power. We'll mention these, these conditions in a minute. Okay, if we want to look at a schematic for this, it would look uh, as follows. Now, part of this we did uh, on Monday. So this top part is just what we did on Monday. So I, I just reproduced this. So we have preferences for goods, and then we have demand and supply for some consumer good. And then remember, once we have demand and supply for the consumer good, we get the market clearing price of the good. And then that price for the good generates revenue for the entrepreneur who can then evaluate the marginal revenue product of his factors of production. He does this, uh, remember, by assessing the marginal physical product of the factor, how much additional output does the factor or, or a unit of the factor produce, and then how much additional revenue does selling that output generate. And then his demand, the entrepreneur's demand for the factor is based upon that extra revenue that's being generated. Uh, we took the Derek Jeter example, right? He generates $14.7 million dollars well, that's the discounted value of what he generates. It's his marginal revenue product, the extra revenue he's generating. And remember we said that then uh, is a determining factor of the rental prices of factors of production once we introduce the interest rate. So remember the, we said the rental price of a factor of production is the discounted marginal revenue product of the factor of production. But you'll notice that the interest rate comes from a different line of cause and effect than, than the one up here. This line of cause and effect includes the physical and value productivity of the factors of production. The marginal revenue product. But the time preference line of uh, cause and effect determines the interest rate. And then the interest rate and the, and the value productivity elements combine to give us the rental price of the factors of production. Then we add up the rental prices, we get capital value. So, so we've covered some of this before. The, the point, again, of putting this schematic up is to see, well, there are two things in this. That the interest rate is determined separately from the productivity of the factors of production. It's determined just by time preference. This is the argument, the, the argument of the pure time preference theory of interest. The productivity of factors of production is up here in this line of cause and effect. It influences the marginal revenue product of the factors the productivity of the factors. The interest rate is separately determined. It, 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 in other words, it isn't determined by the productivity of the factors of production. That's what this, that's what's being argued here. Now, the second thing to notice here, and we'll, we'll get to this uh, more detail in just a minute, is that time, as we said, time preference is manifest in demand and supply of present money for future money. It's not manifest in the uh, demand and supply of present goods for future goods. In fact, present goods don't trade for future goods intertemporally. As we spoke about before, if you want to trade with respect to the forward price value of future goods, you don't take, you don't take your, uh, you know, a forward price is not taking the good you have today and trading it intertemporally with someone else. The two parties agree today to trade the good in the future at a price they agree upon today. Neither one of them has the good. They're not intertemporally trading the good. This is the point, right? We, so this happens only with money. We know this happens with money because we see it in Mark, right? We, this is what, in fact, happens in, in uh, uh, intertemporal exchange in markets. So we have lending going on. Lending occurs in money, not in goods. We'll see why this is important as we go through the uh, discussion. So, uh, so we, we say this explicitly, right? It's demand and supply of present money <clears throat> that generates the rate of interest. <clears throat> okay, so the argument here is, uh, is this, uh, uh, about this uh, idea of present money. Uh, just like in my example uh, uh, before, if we, try, if we think about, uh, uh, this is the ice in uh, winter and ice in summer, if we think about intertemporally trading goods, we talked about intertemporally trading oil, taking present oil and making a contract with somebody today to exchange our present oil. We give them the present oil and they give us back a, a certain amount of oil in the future at an at at a exchange ratio we agree upon today. That exchange ratio between uh, the exchange of present goods could be higher, the same, or lower than the spot exchange ratio uh, between you know the one-to-one -one exchange ratio that exists between a barrel of oil today and a barrel of oil tomorrow. 
because that uh, intertemporal exchange would mix again these two dimensions, the timing of the action with time preference, just like my ice in winter and ice in summer example. We can't get a pure time preference expression when we intertemporally trade goods. But we can when we intertemporally trade money. And again, we know this is uh, true because this is how it's done, right? We see all the intertemporal trade is in fact in money. And, it, and present money always commands a premium over future money. We're talking about in market exchange, right? Not, not when the Bank of Japan you know, pays banks to take, to take present money. Not when the government subsidizes the, the trade, but in actual trade. <clears throat> okay, so this is how the pure rate of interest then emerges as a trade of present money for uh, future money. And this pure rate of uh, interest then would exist in, uh, in, in any exchange of present money for future money. This includes, as we mentioned on Monday, both the credit markets, uh, where a credit transaction is made, where there's an actual contract to you know, stipulating how much money is uh, lent today and how much will be paid back uh, in the future. Uh, the, these uh, credit transactions go into consumer loans and producer loans, the basic division. Uh, and then, uh, as we pointed out, also in the time market, uh, it, that is in the trade of present money for future money, there is the... Uh, uh, entrepreneur, the capitalist entrepreneur, advancing funds to the owners of the factors of production in all of the production processes of the production structure. So the whole production structure is also uh, part of this exchange of present money for future money. And then, as we mentioned again on Monday, it commands, therefore, um, a rate of interest. Now, uh, the other point we want to make about this, since we covered it uh, on Monday, we won't go back to the details, but the other point here is simply to uh, notice once again, and we'll see why this is important when we get to the end and we discuss the enemies of the pure time preference theory, uh, that interest, uh, in interest will exist in actions where there isn't any productivity, there isn't anything being produced or any productivity of any of the factors whatsoever. Interest uh, is also earned in credit markets. And there is no productivity, right? Nothing's being produced. You're just, take, just taking present money. I'm taking $1,000 and I'm lending it to some guy and he's paying me back $1,050 in a year. So once again, it, it, it seems uh, remarkable that uh, someone would try to build an interest rate uh, uh, from the uh, grounds that uh, the interest rate is some sort of a manifestation of the productivity of the factors of production, the productivity of capital or uh, some other such uh, claim. Remember, as we uh, pointed out on Monday, what, what happens actually in these factor uh, exchanges is that the capitalist entrepreneur bids the factor prices because of competition up to their discounted marginal revenue product. That's what he pays his factors of production. And then when he sells his output, he earns the full marginal revenue product. In other words, he, he's earning just an interest return. He's advancing money to the factor owners and then earning the uh, discounted, the, the discount in the discounted value of the marginal revenue product. And, and again, this wouldn't depend upon physical productivity, right? If a factor of production is twice as productive, an entrepreneur will still only earn the interest rate when he buys it and then gets its productivity in, in the revenue when he sells his good. He'll just earn the price spread or the rate of interest. <clears throat> um, uh, this pure rate of interest tends to be the same everywhere in all production processes and loans, credit uh, uh, contracts that uh, have the same time structure. This is because of arbitrage. So if there's any differential earning to be acquired, right, by shifting um, a capital funding away from one line of uh, advancing money to another where the interest rate is higher, then the arbitrage process will eventually eliminate the price differential, just like it does in all markets, right? And so the process of the market uh, brings about uh, uniformity of the pure rate of interest. Uh, notice again, just to, just to say this uh, one more time to uh, head off some of the uh, arguments against the pure time preference theory. Uh, the rate of interest is not determined by demand and supply in credit markets. It's determined by time preference, which then manifests itself in the credit markets. And uh, the rate of interest is not determined by, um, uh, by uh, uh, in, or it's not determined in the capital markets by saving and investing. Once again, it's time preference that determines both 
the intertemporal rate of exchange between present money and future money that's invested into production processes and the degree to which people engage in saving and investing. It, it jointly determines these things. Uh, in the same way that preference jointly determines the price of a good and the amount of the good traded in markets. Right? There's not like a separate causal factor that determines the volume of the thing being traded. No, it's determined by demand too, by demand and supply too. <clears throat> okay, now uh, let's just think, uh, again to head off uh, objections, uh, let's just think about how interest uh, plays a role as a source of uh, gross profit or net income. Because up to this point, we've only been talking about interest as a source of net income or gross profit for the entrepreneur. But as uh, Rothbard uh, points out um, in Man, Economy, and State, this gross profit or net income that's earned by the capitalist entrepreneur has actually four sources. So we can't just look at the net income statement of an entrepreneur and say, well, all of that is interest. This is the point. It, it, in other, to put it differently, if you look at different uh, entrepreneurs' uh, net income statements, they'll show wide variation in the amount of net interest even if we standardize it by the amount of capital they've invested into these processes, right? But we said the rate of interest is uniform. So how can this be? Well, this can be because the interest that's being earned, the interest return in net income is only part of net income. The other uh, sources of uh, net income are profit for entrepreneurial foresight. So sometimes entrepreneurs earn profit by better anticipating uh, demands and, uh, and supply market conditions uh, than uh, their uh, rivals. Uh, entrepreneurs can supply labor into their production processes, in which case they part of their net income would be wages, right, because they're not paying somebody to do this job and they're still earning revenue because the job's being done and so they uh, that, that uh, wage would show up in their net income. And then there are also quasi-wages that are earned from the supply of entrepreneurial leadership in, a, uh, in an enterprise. Uh, this is the idea that an entrepreneur uh, not only would contribute his own productivity if he supplies labor, he, he has his own marginal physical product, marginal revenue product for his own labor, but he can actually increase the uh, marginal physical product, he can increase the productivity of the people around him Whereas if you replace that entrepreneur with somebody else, if you take Steve Jobs out of Apple and you replace him with somebody else, what happens? Right? We know what happens because it's because we've gone through this a few times. Apple gets, I mean, uh, Jobs gets sick. Apple stock goes. Bruh. Well, this is because uh, Jobs. It's not just because of his entrepreneurial foresight, right? It's also because of his leadership ability. Some, for whatever reasons. When Apple's uh, uh, heading up things, other people work more productively with him. He gets people to work more productively with each other, or whatever it is that he's able to do. And so that too will show up in net income, or in the gross profit of the, uh, of the enterprise. <clears throat> okay, now let me just mention uh, another uh, nuance here. And again, we're not going into this in any detail, we just want to mention this so that you see what we're speaking about when we talk about time preference is just this pure rate of interest, right? We're just talking about the interest return in gross profit. We're not explaining all of gross profit. We're not, we're not saying that, the, that time preference explains all of gross profit. It just explains the interest return. Well, same thing here. We're not saying that time preference explains every component of the market rate of interest. We're saying that time preference explains the pure rate of interest. It explains that a component uh, we might say the fundamental component of any market rate of interest. But in addition to that, uh, a market rate of interest will have an uh, entrepreneurial uncertainty component to it as well. So uh, rates of return, right, return that's being earned in high risk ventures will be higher than, uh, in order to attract the capitalists, will be higher than in uh, ventures where uh, there's less a lesser degree of uncertainty. It will be different, right? We'll get variation in the, in the interest returns between different endeavors depending upon the entrepreneurial uncertainty associated with this endeavor. Um, I might add that this is part of the, uh, this is part of the, um, or one illustration of this would be uh, Bob Higgs's uh, 
theory of regime uncertainty that he brings to bear in explaining the duration of the Great Depression, where he points out that, you know, <laughs> the capitalist entrepreneurs who are sitting on the sidelines not investing in the Great Depression because of the great deg uh, greater degree of uncertainty that was created by the flux of government programs, right? All the New Deal monetary takeovers of, uh, of the Roosevelt administration. And in order to get them in to invest, they would have had to have much higher rates of return, which weren't forthcoming, right? So they just sat on the sidelines. This is the idea. Uh, there's also a price premium. Uh, the price premium refers to Cantillon effects when there's a monetary inflation. When there's a monetary inflation, uh, Richard Cantillon pointed out that uh, there won't be a, a proportionate uh, effect on the prices of all goods synchronously, that the prices of some goods will go up to a greater degree, like in our last boom bust, the housing prices right, go up to a different higher degree than other prices did. And uh, some prices will go up uh, sooner in the process and others only later. Well, if you're, in, if you're an entrepreneur in the construction business and the boom starts, your prices go up disproportionately. And so your, net, your return that you're earning here is disproportionately high, right? This is the idea. We can get differences in the, in the, uh, in the return, the interest return that's being earned in these different uh, endeavors just because of the disproportionate price effects of inflation. And then as Rothbard, Rothbard pointed out, if, if entrepreneurs are unable to anticipate changes in the PPM, this too will show up in the market rate of interest. Again, we're not gonna go into detail about these different components. So again, the main point is just to see that uh, time preference theory of interest does not explain these other three components of the market rate. It's not, it's not right? Those are caused by other factors. <clears throat> uh, the claim is that it explains only the pure rate of interest. <clears throat> Okay, now let's get to the uh, part about enemies uh, of the, uh, of the um, a pure time preference theory. And to do this, uh, let's just uh, use uh, Boombavork's uh, very helpful um, description of what he calls the interest problem. So he very famously posed the problem in the, uh, right, right at the very beginning of uh, Capital and Interest. Um, that the interest problem is this. Capital, possession of capital seems to uh, grant to its owner an indefinite stream of income. Or to put it more in line with a pure time preference uh, view of this, <clears throat> if we have a capital good, we know that the current price of this capital good will be bid up to the sum of the discounted marginal revenue products that are you know, forthcoming or anticipated to be forthcoming uh, if, to the entrepreneur who owns this capital good. That means that when, when you buy the capital good, as the marginal revenue product is earned every year, you will get the interest premium, right? You will earn the sum of the marginal revenue products over time, but you only paid the sum of the discounted marginal revenue products. What explains this value difference? That's the interest problem, right? Where does this value difference come from? Now, we've seen the pure uh, time preference uh, explanation, right? So the pure time preference explanation is this difference between the revenue that comes in from owning the capital good and what you pay to buy it, the difference in, in, in those two sums of money, is um, due to uh, time preference. It's due to the time discount factor. Okay, well, that's not the only... Uh, explanation that's been offered. Uh, another explanation uh, was the Marxian kind of explanation, right, uh, called the exploitation theory of interest. <clears throat> and the exploitation theory of interest says that interest is a surplus value of labor that the capitalist extracts. And he does this through the property relations, right, and all that Marxist uh, garbage. So, uh, <clears throat> So what are the, you know, Boombavrik very famously criticized this view and he said, look, uh, first of all, a uh, sort of foundational problem with this view is it's based on the fallacious labor theory of value. And then Boombavrik says, but let's waive that consideration. Let's just set that aside. You know, that would be devastating in and of itself, but let's set it aside. And, uh, and, then, and, and move on to the claim just on the basis of what actually happens in the market. And as he points out, what actually happens in the market, the second point, is that labor is paid the full val its full value. In other words, 
if you added up all of the marginal revenue products of all of the different factors of production, and we're, now we're, again, we're ignoring profit, we're ignoring the other sources of net income, we're just saying, let's set aside entrepreneurial foresight and the wages of the entrepreneur and, uh, and so on. If we, if we just think about the uh, uh, discount value, the basic discount value, <clears throat> if you add up all of the marginal revenue products, that does in fact equal the full value of the output produced. The reason for this is because of entrepreneurial competition to buy the factors of production. They will bid the factors of production, they'll bid their prices up to the point where the value of uh, what they pay is exactly equal to the value of the revenue they receive less the discount, right? That's what we're trying to explain. Why is it not, why aren't these prices of the factors of production fully bid up to uh, the value that, of the things that they're producing? And Boombofrick says they are, except for the discount, right? They are bid all the way up. And he says the way to, the way to uh, prove this, that, that what's, what's being undertaken here is simply that this, this uh, lower value that's paid to the workers and you know, the uh, other factor owners, uh, that this lower value is just a discount is, uh, well, you could do this in two ways. You could say, the laborer could earn his full marginal revenue product if he's just willing to wait to be paid. If Derek Jeter doesn't want to be paid monthly as salary, if he waits for two years to be paid when all the revenue comes in, then he would earn more money. He would earn the full value of his marginal revenue product. Why? Because the entrepreneurs would bid his price up to that full value. And, and the entrepreneurs would earn only profit then, and entrepreneurial wages and quasi-wages. They would not earn interest. Interest is earned for advancing people money. And then Boom Bobrick says, well, let's suppose the, uh, the worker doesn't want to do this. The worker could still earn the full marginal re revenue product by doing this. He could, just, he could just take his pay in advance and then lend it out. Why doesn't he just take his full pay that he gets from the entrepreneur and then lend it out into credit markets? Then in a year or wh whatever time it would be that he would have been paid his full marginal revenue product, he'll have his full marginal revenue product. Boom Barbara says, okay, QED, right? That's, that's just proof that this, that this difference between the two is simply the value of the discount, the time discount, if you will. <clears throat> okay, so that's uh, one, uh, one enemy. Now, another enemy of the pure time preference theory are the productivity theorists. <clears throat> and uh, their basic uh, position is that capital, capital generates a flow of productive services. And interest really is the value of the flow of the services. And we can think about this either in uh, physical terms, just the physical productivity of the capital good, or in value terms. So, so you have some productivity theorists who are what Boombopper calls naive, because they think they can prove, they, they can prove this, uh, this argument about where this perpetual income from owning capital comes from by just looking at physical productivity. Uh, and then uh, uh, another camp that are value productivity. Uh, theorists. They think the interest rate comes from the value of the productivity that capital uh, generates. Okay, so what? So let's start with the with the physical productivity guys. And uh, there's some very famous uh, names here with some very famous examples in the literature. Uh, this particular example of Rice comes from uh, uh, Samuelson. Uh, Frank Knight had uh, Crusonia plants. Well, actually, there was just one, I guess, Crusonia plant. Um, Fisher, Irving Fisher had sheep, a herd of sheep. In all these examples, the point is this. You, you, have, you have a one good economy. You have uh, you know, 100 units of rice. And in a year, it, it uh, generates another 10 units. So just, just because of its physical productivity, it generates another 10. It's like the, so the sheep herd, you have 100 sheep. And then, you know, right, they have little lambs, and so now you have 110 at the end of a year. So, and you can keep doing this indefinitely, right? Uh, the Crusonia plant just, just grows 10%, physically grows 10% every year. This is the idea. So you have a one good economy, and perhaps you, you'll notice the key, um, the key additional assumption here is that uh, 
since you just have one good, you don't have any trade, right? There's no, this, this is the crucial point, right? So of course, if, if you have an account, if you structure a model with an economy that, where there's no trade, then obviously you can't have intertemporal trade. Obviously you can't have a time preference manifestation of interest. You can't have any discount, right? So you've sort of assumed away um, uh, the possibility of a pure time preference explanation here. But let's again just think about what this, uh, think about the, uh, the counter argument, the pure time preference counter argument to this. Um, Okay, so f uh, the first thing, of course, to notice is that, as we said before, that the physical productivity of a capital good or the physical productivity of the, of the rice or the whatever it is, the sheep, uh, if we did have an economy where there were prices and right, ownership of these things where you could trade and there were prices, would affect only the marginal revenue product. It would only affect that portion of its uh, rental price. The, the part of the rental price that, that uh, uh, is encapsulated in marginal revenue product. So if instead of uh, 100 units of rice maturing into 110, if it, were, if it matured into 120, then it would command a higher rental price because its marginal revenue product would be larger. But this would have nothing to do with the interest rate. Right? How people see the intertemporal value of future rice versus present rice is, is not systematically affected by that. Right? They're not, they're not in the, as we said before, in the same causal chain of argument. The interest rate traces back to time preference, which isn't causally related to the productivity of uh, factors of production. <clears throat> okay, so that's the first uh, problem. And by the way, the, the other argument with respect to this physical productivity examples are you can't really, these aren't really adequate to explain what needs to be explained because they, the implicit assumption is that the rice or the sheep or whatever it is are in fact valuable. The Crusonia plant keeps Crusoe alive on his island. Right? The rice can be eaten and uh, the sheep can be sheared and so on and so forth, right? So I don't think uh, that Samuelson or Knight or Fisher would argue uh, something like this. Let's suppose we have a Crusonia weed and it grows 10% per year. And therefore, Crusoe says, you know, I'm earning a 10% rate of return on the growth of this weed, which not only don't, do I not consume, but I hate because it crowds out my actual food. No, of course not, right? There's some implicit assumption that the physical productivity here is actually valuable. And this is what permits this argument to seem sensible even though, again, it uh, fails on uh, deeper logical uh, problems. Now, uh, let me point out then, if we had trade, just, just so you see how this would work in the market, let's suppose we go down here to this step. If we have trade, then the monetary return on investment in rice will always be the interest return. Uh, this particular case is, uh, uh, that it's po these cases of Crusonia plants and so on, are all uh, perpetual, so the rice is never you never eat the 100 units. It's, it's never uh, destroyed by disease or anything. Just every year it increases 10% ad infinitum. So, uh, okay, so what if we had something like that in the real world? What if we had a, a, a factor that uh, produced a value, an additional value somehow, uh, perpetually, indefinitely? Well, then we could calculate its capital value quite simply with this formula. The capital value of a perpetuity is just its marginal revenue product, the, the revenue return that it's generating, divided by the rate of interest, right? That's how you do it. So, you, you know, the British government used to uh, issue perpetuities, and, and you could very easily figure out what, what to pay for them because their capital value is just the face value payment that you get divided by the going rate of interest. Okay, so let's, again, have money so we can do this. Let's assume that each uh, unit of rice commands a dollar, it's worth a dollar. So we have $100 as the capital value of 100 units of rice, and it's generating $10 of uh, revenue, you know, extra rice every year. Uh, that's a 10% return, right? So the 10% return, $10 generates a capital value of $100. But this 10% this is independent of the productivity. That's the whole point. How is this 10% determined? And the answer is by time preference. What if people's time preferences go down to 5%? What if they now discount that $10 return that is generated every year 
less heavily. Well, then the capital value of the Crusonia plant or the, or the 100 units of rice will go to $200. So that the return that you earn on this uh, investment in the, in the units of rice is exactly 5%. It, it will conform to people's time preferences. The rate of return on every investment in the economy will conform to people's time preferences. Again, setting aside the other, the other uh, complications that we mentioned before. <clears throat> okay, uh, now let me just, since I, I, I want to get to the rest of these, uh, let, but let me just mention that uh, Fisher also uh, has examples where he tries to do this with uh, other goods. So he has sheep, which are productive. He has hardtack, which produces nothing. Hardtack is like uh, beef jerky. Is that even around today? I don't know. It's, it's like a, you know, a, a prepared, like, like a salted and prepared meat that doesn't spoil, that you can eat any time. It doesn't, so you don't expand your supply of it. You just have a fixed amount. And then he does an example with figs. And he says, look, in the hardtack case, the, the rate of return is going to be zero. In the figs case, it'll be negative. But you can see that that won't be the case at all, right? In fact, if you have these goods traded in markets and you invest in them, they will always earn the time preference rate of interest or they won't be invested in, right? If, if they're, if they're uh, not generating more value than, than uh, the resources necessary to produce them. But, th but there will never be a negative rate of interest on, on any uh, uh, investment. Okay, so now let's go on to uh, the next. These are, uh, Boombobber calls eclectic theories. Eclectic theories are uh, theories that try to argue that uh, the interest rate is mutually determined, mutually determined by time preferences on the supply of present money side and productivity capital on the demand side. Right, so this is a fairly standard kind of approach you would find in neoclassical economics. But as we've argued before, this kind of mutual determination really violates the ends means causal chain. You, you really have to have an entirely different conception of how you're reasoning about prices uh, in order to uphold a, an argument like this. You cannot have a causal uh, chain of uh, uh, set in motion uh, when you reason like this, uh, precisely because the, the value productivity of capital is determined by, um, uh, is also determined by preferences. And so you're actually involved in the fallacy of the vicious circle here by assuming, well, in our case, the value productivity of the factors of production is determined by the rate of interest. Because in order to know the value, the monetary value of a capital good, I have to know the interest rate by which I discount the future revenues. I, I have to know that already in order to establish what, the, what I'm willing to pay, the value productivity of the capital good right now. And so just like with uh, demand and supply for goods, when you try to think of mutual determination productivity or cost of production on the, on the supply side and, and preferences on the demand side, you're caught in this uh, vicious circle. <clears throat> okay, so this uh, doesn't uh, work too well. Uh, Boombavrik's theory is a little bit more complicated, but in a way also suffers from the same kind of problem. Boombavrik, uh, first of all, defines time preference in terms of this uh, premium of uh, present goods. So notice the first problem with Boombavrik is he doesn't give us a, uh, uh, an adequate explanation of the rate of interest because he starts with a, a step, he starts with a step that's too far forward in the chain of logic. He doesn't start with valuing. He starts with the objective difference between the uh, price of a present good and the price of, of that good in the future. He defines time preference as the difference between uh, the value of present and future goods, the price difference, the exchange rate difference. Uh, okay, so that won't work, right? We have to trace explanations all the way back to preferences, all the way back to satisfactions, in other words. That's why the pure time preference theory starts with time preference saying a satisfaction sooner is preferred to the same satisfaction later. Okay, then he says, these time preferences will be affected by what he calls subjective factors. <clears throat> these are things like uh, people expect to have more goods in the future, so they, so they prefer present goods now because they think they'll be more fully supplied already in the future. Uh, people uh, uh, systematically undervalue future wants, and so they prefer present goods more highly because they can satisfy present ones. But again, these are just psychological 
features of acting. You know, some people are like this, other people aren't. This doesn't really give us any satisfactory logical explanation. And then the value productivity is, is his roundaboutness of production argument where he says, present goods have greater value because if you, if you possess them, you can start right now on longer production processes and you can arrive at, at, at the greater valued goods more readily than you can if all you have are future goods, right? If you have to wait to get these producer goods. So you, naturally you desire present goods more readily because your, your end can be attained uh, more directly, so to speak, by these production processes. But the problem with this, again, is the problem of the vicious circle. In order to have value productivity generated by these, by these uh, factors of production, you have to already know the rate of interest. It already has to be existing so you can discount the future revenues that you're anticipating earning in the future from engaging in this pro uh, production process so you know how much to pay today to buy these factors of production. Without the interest rate, you can't do the calculation Therefore, you can't know if, the, if it's value productive or not, the investment, whether it's going to generate this value productivity. Okay, so that's uh, a boom work. And then the last theory I want to mention is uh, what's called the weighting theory <clears throat> of uh, interest. And th this argues in the following way. It says, well, the reason there's a value difference between if you add up the marginal revenue product of all the factors of production and then look at what's paid for them, the reason there's a value difference is we've left out a factor of production. And th that factor of production is weighting. So this view, again, common among the neoclassical economists, treats weighting as a factor of production. And says if we include weighting as a factor of production and the interest rate is its price, and then we include it, well then we, when we sum up all the factor prices, they would add up to the full value of the product. And so we've just, we've we just arbitrarily yanked out weighting uh, from our consideration. And if we put it in, well then the problem is solved and we don't need time preference per se to explain this. Now there are two problems uh, with this. And, and the reason I put weighting in parenthesis is because the, the way in which the, these guys define weighting is, weighting is defined as the supply of present money. Weighting isn't defined as you know, sitting around and in a queue. Weighting is defined as supplying present money. Well, okay, if waiting is defined as supplying present money, then, then that supply is determined by time preferences. And they'll, and they'll admit this. They say, yeah, yeah, it's determined by time. So in my view, waiting is just some sort of superfluous mediating concept then. Why insert waiting that just adds unnecessarily to the concepts involved in this? You know, time preference leads to waiting, which leads to the interest rate. Why not just say time preference leads to the interest rate? Or, you know, supply of present money to the interest rate. This is just... Uh, semantics, I guess, run amok. Um, and then another problem with this, and maybe in the interest of time, I'll skip over the details, but for those of you who uh, are already familiar with the marginal productivity uh, theory of uh, factor price, right, the, how we factor price with marginal revenue product, try thinking through exactly how you would do this for weighting defined as supplying present money. What is the marginal physical product then of weighting? And Okay, try to work that out. I, I, uh, uh, the, uh, I'll give you the end result is it, it ends badly. <laughs> it, does, it does not end well. Okay, now let me just mention two other recent criticisms, and we won't go through uh, Dr. Murphy's theory or Dr. Holtzman. I just want to mention the criticisms they make of the pure time preference theory. Um, uh, first of all, Murphy says, look, in the pure time preference theory literature, there are really two definitions of uh, time preference. And, and he's right about this. One is the boom Bavarkian definition, uh, the distinction between uh, present goods and future goods. There's a premium on present goods relative to future goods. Then the other, more fetter uh, definition is this satisfaction definition we gave before. And so Murphy says, look, if you define time preference as a present satisfaction is a preferred over a future satisfaction, then you can ensure a premium of the present, that's true. But you can't apply that directly to the exchange of goods. And so you can't, you can't, there's no manifestation of this in the market necessarily. Now if you, on the contrary, define time preference as the premium on present goods over future goods, then you can directly apply this to market activity. Is there goods traded in the market and so on? But you can't ensure that there's a premium of present goods. 
but perhaps you already see what, uh, what the response will be to Murphy's challenge here. The, the problem is that um, uh, what Murphy is ignoring here is that the pure time preference theory says that it's present money traded for future money that solves this dilemma. This is the escape, right? Because money allows you to isolate time preference. And so you're not intermixing the timing value of a good with the time preference issue uh, uh, related to the good. And it's the same problem with this second point, right? It's, it's really the same, the same difficulty stated a different way. Time preference is satisfaction, he says, is neither necessary nor sufficient to create a premium. That's true if you're looking at the trade of goods for goods, this intertemporally, that's true. In other words, you can find instances where intertemporally a, a present good would have a greater value than, a, than the same good in the future because the timing of having it in the present is worth more. And that's not time preference, right? That's another reason that's creating that premium. But again, this, is, this problem is dispelled by just noticing that the argument is really that it's present money that commands a premium over future money, not goods over goods. And then uh, uh, Professor Holtzman's uh, criticisms uh, are these two. He claims that the pure time preference theory makes two contradictory claims. The lar a larger stock of a future good is preferred to a smaller stock of that good in the present. That's one claim. And the second claim is that present good, the present good and that good in the future are different goods. This is a claim that Mises makes. Well, you can see the problem. If you hold both those claims at the same time, you can hardly argue that the reason why future goods that have more value are uh, foregone for present goods that have less value is because of time preference. You can't argue that on the one hand and simultaneously hold that present goods that you're trading for the future goods are different goods. See, see the problem? But again, uh, perhaps you can see that the solution to this is already present in noticing again that it's present money for future money that's being traded. And, and so this problem is escaped by just noticing that the pure time preference theory does not claim that, that we have intertemporal trade of goods. It's intertemporal trade of money. And then the final point, uh, the time preference, he, uh, Professor Holtzman again correctly points out, the time preference is between two options of choice for the same good, as Mises conceives it, but the interest rate is between present goods and future goods. Again, he's, he's intermixed these two different elements, right? If we think about this with respect to money, then this is not, again, we escape this, uh, this claim, the, 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 the brunt of this. It, it is true, we take present money and we trade that, that physical money for future money, right? We, we are trading one use of the good for a different use of the good. And, and interest emerges on this trade. And present goods for future goods has nothing to do with it. Okay, I've uh, gone over a little bit. Sorry about that. So uh, stop here. <laughs>